Mark, lovely to talk to you again. Lovely to see you again. Yeah, you too, Johnny. Great to see and, and hear from you again. Yeah. Right. Let's start on a bright note amidst this gloomy scenario. Um, two million pound profit. That, that's, that's not heard in football, let alone Portsmouth Football Club, is it? No, I mean, it follows on, you know, for a number of years, we've been, like we've said, us created a self-sustaining model at the club where we've just about been losing a little bit one year, but on the whole, just turning in very small profits because we reinvest that back into the club. But um, how this season fell with the late sour of Matt Clark, it has actually tipped us into a profit situation, um, which, which is great news, you know. But as I say, that money's there just to be reinvested back in the club by way of um, transfer fees, player salaries, and and obviously, you know, just, just the general running of the club and keep improving it. So it's a great profit, and it's a great profit for the club because it just enables us to keep growing, continuing, and getting better year on year. Is this what Michael Eisner meant when he stood on the Guildhall stage and said about a properly run football club? Yeah, I think that's exactly um, what he said. Um, and to be fair, he, he, the reason he bought the club was because it was being run so well and, and that was under fan ownership. So, you know, it was great of Michael, you know, to, to really appreciate what we were doing as a club, even under fan ownership. And he's, he's just really carried on that legacy as he said he would. Yeah, you look at the supporters' trust, you look at the Michael Eisner and, and, and the family, but imagine this had happened, this virus had come along in, say, 2012. This this club would be dead and gone, wouldn't it? I, I would, yeah, I think it would have been difficult. I think at the moment it would have still been okay because, as I say, the... The EFL have front-loaded um, a lot of revenue that was, was due to be paid out over the, the next five or six months. So it's brought that forward. It's also set up um, a loan scheme to help clubs get through the first month or two. And if you align that with the government incentives that are out there, um, you know, put all that together. Even clubs that are really, really financially distressed at the moment, of which thankfully Portsmouth isn't one, they should be okay for the next month or two, but it will be in the, the three to six month period that this will really start to buy it. I mean, the government have created this scheme, furloughed staff. It's a bit of a godsend for football clubs, really, isn't it? Well, it wasn't. You know, it's a, it's a godsend, I think, for businesses generally, of which football, obviously, when you, when you strip it all back, it is a business. It, you know, it has responsibilities both in regards of its revenue and its expenditure. So it's no different to any other business in the UK at the moment. But, yeah, to answer the question in regards of that specific element of the, what the government have done to try and assist businesses, it's been very, very helpful. And, again, not just for football but for businesses generally. It's a win-win situation, really. Yeah, I mean, well, it's a win-win situation at the moment. But, you know, at some point, what all these incentives have to be paid back, whether it's via the EFL in regards to the loans and, and the money they're front-loaded um, that was already due. So, as I say, in the mid to longer term, that's when I think you'll start to see more of the fallout from this pandemic, unfortunately. In what way will that affect somebody like Portsmouth? Well, we've, we've said Portsmouth for in a, you know, through years of what we consider to be correct management over of a football club since the club came out of administration. Um, you know, it, sh it should, you know, we're in a very, very solid um, place, in especially con compared to our peers in the football world. So we should be in a better position financially to withstand the fallout from this. Um, you know, as I say, over months, probably three to four onwards. And if we do come out the other side, you know, successfully enough clubs, you know, in, in, a, in a position to carry on as, as we are, um, I think that it won't just be football, but more generally in business, the government are going to have some huge um, debts that need to be serviced. So I think that, that, I mean, I'm talking more in the general economy, and it's got to be a payback at some time. But Given how we have run the club, we should be in a strong financial position to withstand that. From your calls and Zoom meetings you'll have had with the various organisations, the EFL, the FA, is there some kind of consensus from football clubs? One would imagine that the season, they want the season to end in some way. 
I think that's where, you know, the FA, um, EFL, Premier League are quite aligned on trying to get this season finished. Um, you know, I mean, first and foremost, it's, it's difficult to talk about things, trying to get the season finished when will the next season start, when literally now hundreds of people are dying <coughs> per day just in the United Kingdom. So I think we have to get some perspective on it, especially when you start talking about the integrity of the league. Um, to me, you know, the integrity of the league is obviously very important, but most important is what is best for our fans, you know, our supporters and, and people in the, in the wider country, you know, people generally. We want to, obviously, their, their health and well-being is at the fore, needs to be at the forefront of everyone. <coughs> but, you know, I think the, the main thing is commercially, if you read the newspapers, and I'm not party to anything more than anyone else, just hear little bits of inside information, but the potential loss from the Sky deal commercially will tip a lot of clubs over the edge, um, especially in the EFL, maybe even as high up as the Premier League. Who knows? The figures being talked about are so vast. So it makes commercial sense at this moment to try and finish the 2019-20 season. However, I think if that commercial argument, so if, if some deals were done with Sky or, or the EFL and the Premier League didn't feel that that money... Um, you know, was going to be such a big issue, you know, because they could do a deal, then perhaps maybe there would be a shift in emphasis to saying, look, you know, there's a lot bigger things going on in the world at the moment. We just have to call a day with this season, you know, that will spark off a load of separate rows, but I won't go into that at the moment. Um, and then just we can sort of dust ourselves down both of a country and as a sport and then start focusing on hopefully the resumption of football with a new season in August or September or whenever that may be. So I don't know. Initially, it was all about let's get the season finished. But I think that if the if the commercial validity of that doesn't become an issue anymore, then I think focus may turn to just starting a new season. And and that is just my opinion. When is it likely that a decision will be made on all of this, Johnny? I, I honestly can't tell you. the The one thing I think we've learned through this period, the last few months, is is the only thing that's certain is the uncertainty. So I don't think you can accurately pinpoint a date um, when, you know, things might start to hopefully upturn for the better. Um, I suppose like, like you all, you, you've got this morbid fascination now every day where you're looking at the death rate and the, the new cases where you please come down, please come down. And unfortunately at the moment, it looks like it just keeps creeping up. So where you can put a line and, and let's just say it spirals over the next few weeks in common with Italy, Spain. It looks like America's going that way as well now, you know, a lot of the countries. But until that rate starts to come down and then at what level it's coming down, does the government start to relax all, all the, the things they've put in at the moment to stop the spread? When they start to relax those regulations as such, like then you can probably start talking about it. But I think it's a bit crass at the moment for us to be talking about when's the season going to start when so many people are dying on a daily basis because of this disease yeah what you say there rings out true because you know the way the club has handled this situation from the start has been exemplary and i think christian burgess mentioned it the other day i think the um something we've, we've said you know internally and you and you know as well as me johnny that you know because you've been in a lot of the meetings that we can't control the virus but we can control our communication and something we've tried to do both internally you know with all of our staff and in the wider public to our supporters and beyond is try to keep that communication flow going so I don't think we've done anything other than try and prioritize what is important and obviously people's health our staff's health you know employees players non-playing staff that is our absolute priority. Um, everything else there remains secondary, but you know we felt that we've had this obligation both in regards of like the testing that we did. You know we were very open and honest with getting that information out. You know who had contracted the virus. So we just sort of have really tried to keep both our staff internally and the wider public aware of what we're doing as a football club. And listen, I'm not saying we've got it right 100 percent of the times. You never do, but as long as you're open, honest, transparent, that sort of ticks 80% of the boxes, even if you maybe get the 
another 20 percent wrong um at least you're doing it with the best intentions how are the players that that contacted it, um that got coronavirus how are they faring now yeah well ones that had coronavirus because i think um that they're beyond their time now that they're deemed as uh, having it so yeah i speak to them the last time i spoke to them was two days ago where all of them absolutely now no problems no symptoms and you know are starting um their, their way back into fitness how is it possible for you to plan for next season when you still have this one hanging over you you can't johnny i mean all you can do is do different scenarios of when the hopefully the resumption may start again so if it starts again in may this is what happens if it starts again in june this is what happens but I go back to what I said before, it's, it's such an uncertain world there, not just for football, but for the economy and for people generally. You, you can't accurately plan anything at the moment. All you can do is have different contingencies along the way, depending when potentially we may start to come back and get back to a level of normality and specific in football, what is going to be normal? Is it going to be playing behind closed doors for a spell? just to get, you know, hopefully finish this season or if not, start next. Um, mass gatherings, you know, I'm, I think in the scheme of things at the moment, that's, that's looking a long way down the line. You know, and again, that's just my personal opinion. But, you know, in the models and the contingencies that we're doing, we are planning for a resumption of football, but maybe not, um, you know, with, with fans in the stand. You talk about yeah playing behind closed doors. Surely, with something like the Leasings dot com final, that couldn't happen, could it? Because it's almost a people's final. Well, it, it could happen. Obviously, it could happen. But would I personally be pushing? I would rather delay and delay and delay that to have fans in the stadium to for the Leasing dot com to take place behind closed doors. And I don't know how Salford feel about this or or the EFL, but I just couldn't see the point of that as a one-off game. It just wouldn't make any sense to me at all. It only makes sense if, you know, we can all join together, hopefully post, you know, the COVID-19's effect on the world, you know, that we can play this game, you know, on, um, at Wembley with a packed house, you know, and it's a big day out. If, if it's not that, I, I would be probably lean towards not playing it. But again, that's just my opinion. I haven't spoken to anyone else about that. Have players' contracts been discussed here? They traditionally run out on June the 30th. Yeah, so the out-of-contract players, obviously we, we stay in touch with them on an individual basis, but I've seen it muted out there as part of a wider solution to maybe getting this season finished, if that is feasible. Um, you know, players having it really via the PFA, a, a blanket extension on players' contracts. But um, like I, I spoke to Christian this morning, actually, while I was out on my walk and, uh, you know, I just, just explained to him that, you know, in isolation, it's not something I don't, I wouldn't want him or any of our players to worry about at the moment. You know, we're, we're committed to the, the end of their contracts on June 30th. At that point, um, if there is a chance for this season to finish, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be a blanket extension um, agreement between the PFA, the EFL, the FA and the Premier League that will get them through. And if not, then you're back to negotiating. Do they want to extend extensions to their existing contracts or have they got deals elsewhere? So, um, yeah, it's just, just pretty standard stuff, really, Johnny. During, during this extraordinary period, do things like the stadium go on hold, literally? Or do you, are you still well, planning for that? <laughs> it's, it's funny you should ask that question because there's difficulties. I mean, yet the, a lot of the projects, you know, we can put on hold, but there is the essential health and safety work that needs to be done. And specifically, there's a, a big project that needs to be undertaken this season on the North Stand in regards of the roof and the cladding and the general structure um, that is a 12 to 16 week piece of work. Now, if you read some of the articles, again, we have to have contingencies in place. They're saying that this, the close season this year might be very short. So there is a possibility that they rush to end this season, have just a two to three week break, um, and then start next season. Now, these works literally cannot be put off or 
you could arrive at, I don't want to spook anyone here, but you could arrive at the unthinkable situation that these works not being done this summer could result in something worse than maybe even um, a heavy cut in capacity for next year in the North Stand. So we are, we are currently talking with specialists, the local council, um, the construction firms about potentially starting these works now because construction's not in lockdown. We would need to be convinced, you know, that their, their own health and safety policies comply with um, government recommendations at the moment. But there is an opportunity now that if you look at it, there is a possibility where the season may not commence for the next three to four months. So now may be the opportunity to actually get those works done. Um, and we are, we're in discussions with that at the moment. And on heart. Do you yeah. think that football can ever come back the same? Um, yes, I really do. I think we've got to get over these three to four month period um, of everyone coming together, players via the PFA, you know, the EFL, the Premier League, the government. If everyone can come together, work together over the next three to four months, um, then I do believe hand on heart that we can come through the other side. Um, you know, with something that resembles what the structures that we have now. But again, it's back to how long does this go on for, Johnny, and what does the government do next, not just to help football, but to help businesses more generally to, to get through this. But yeah, hand on heart, I think it is possible. It's not a, a, a cause that I've written off at the moment, but um, the next three to six months are going to be critical. Football and sport rightly takes a backward step but we've got our fans out there. We've got businesses out there. Thoughts for them? Thoughts for them was the question. Yeah. That, yeah. In this crisis. Well, yeah, obviously, I mean, as I've said, you know, during our, our discussions in the last 20 minutes and, and as I've said from really the start of this outbreak, absolute priority is, you know, not just our staff, not just our supporters, but people in the, in the wider general public. You know, we all have to be on our guard looking out for those those around us that are, you know, infirm, you know, need help at this time, you know, the, the less able in our society. And, you know, via Pom Pompey in the community, Claire, we're doing a lot of things with the NHS. Claire's doing a lot of things. But I, I know our fans. I don't have to request this because our fans are brilliant anyway. And, you know, I think to get there's been a lot of togetherness shown in society generally as, as we're working through this. And, you know, just, just keep looking out for people um, and, and do what we're doing. It seems that, you know, the first week of the lockdown, the first weekend, there was a lot of shock horror with, with what was going on. People weren't really taking it seriously. But I think since then, everyone's pulled together. Everyone on the whole has started to respect the rules, realise the seriousness of this situation. But in regards to football, it just pals into insignificance. And, you know, someone that loves football as much as I do, I can't believe I'm saying that. But, you know, there are more important things in life and getting as many people through this, whether they be Pompey fans, fans of other clubs, people in general society, it's irrelevant. Let's just do everything that we can to help people get through this crisis and we lose as less people possible as we can. It does put us all in the same boat, doesn't it? How, how are you coping with isolation? Are you go on a little run now and again? Yeah, well, it was, uh, I don't know, I'd maybe I'd be interested to hear what other people say about this, but it was a struggle for the first couple of days, you know, I didn't shave, I was in my pyjamas, you know, I was just eating, drinking and like piling on a few pounds. And then I took a conscious decision um, that I was just going to get up every morning, get up early, early, go for, you know, a walk, a bit of walking, a bit of jogging, um, three quarters of an hour, an hour, which I haven't done for years and years and years. So I've stuck to that. I come home, I have a shower, you know, I put a shirt on because there's a lot of these meetings now, these video call meetings that you know, seem to be part of our day. So I took that conscious decision and I think quite a few people out there have done exactly the same. I think the worst thing you could do is just, you know, sit there, feel sorry for yourself, you know, eat, drink, you know, don't, don't look after yourself. So that's what I'm trying to do, you know, every every person to, to themselves really. But um, yeah, that would be my advice. Just try and get up and do something if you can even. And the government are recommending that, you know, if people do exercise and I've tried to adhere to that. Are the pressures greater? What, through this virus than running yeah. the football club normally? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Felt 
a lot more responsibility, a lot more responsibility to our staff, a lot more responsibility to, you know, our fellow men. Um, you know, I know that seems a bit weird to say that, but, um, you know, we, as a, as a family, we've been trying to look out for other people, you know, people that we know that are, are elderly, are they okay? So I do think it's brought people together, but go back to the question, have I felt more of a pressure? Yes, because you're dealing with people's lives, both from a health point of view and economically. And that's why we've been committed from the start of this to, you know, Johnny, again, because you've been on the meetings and in discussions with our owners at the very, very first meeting, we had to discuss just how serious this was. Our absolute priority has been one, you know, the health and safety, not just of our, our players and fans and staff, but in the wider public, but then economically, um, that we were going to fight to the bitter end to keep our staff employed in full and on 100% of their money. And that continues to be our policy. Well, we, we all pray to get back to normality, whatever normality may be. But, yeah. you know, thanks for joining us today, no, Mark. Listen, thank you, Johnny. And listen, everyone else out there, just stay safe. Follow the government guidelines, you know. The quicker we get through this, obviously, the better. But, you know, I just want everyone, as many of you as possible, just to come through this. And I'm sure that you will by following the government guidelines. And thank you.